What is up guys, it's another Monday Night Rewind podcast where we go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars and cover episodes of Raw and Nitro from 1997. And so this week it is November 17th, 1997 and we're covering Raw number 234 and Nitro 114. So of course we'll start with Raw and then move on to Nitro. So Raw first, once again I forgot to get the rating so I'll do that at the very end. But uh, this Raw took place in Cornwall, Ontario, so they're still up in Canada. So still dealing, you know, with the whole backlash of Brett, the whole Montreal Screwjob with Bret Hart and stuff. And so the show starts off with a replay of the main event from last week. So it's got Shamrock, or so it was the Shamrock versus Triple H match that we covered. And I said at the very end was uh, Triple H was pinning Shamrock before it hit three um, the shows ended or whatever, fade to black, and so we never saw the finish. Well, it comes back and they say, you know, the cameras were rolling and this is what happened. Shamrock did end up kicking out of the match and then something happens, but Shawn Michaels and Triple H are in the ring and Sergeant Slaughter gets up in there. And so Triple H and Shawn Michaels are start shoving, doing, have a shoving match with Sergeant Slaughter. And Sergeant Slaughter ends up pushing Sean, and Sean starts falling backwards. Well, Ken Shamrock grabs him, rolls him up, and then Sar uh, Sergeant Slaughter gets on the ground, counts the three, and so they, you know, ring the bell or whatever, saying that Shamrock won, but he ended up, you know, beating Shawn Michaels, who the match wasn't with, so he technically didn't win anything, but it shows that he did get a win over the champion and stuff, so kind of solidifying and leading up to Shamrock having a championship match, I believe, but that's, I guess, what that was, so they wanted to show us that and bring that to us first. So then it goes to the open and comes back and it starts off with Stone Cold coming out to the ring to cut a promo. And so he get, comes out to the ring, grabs the microphone, starts saying some stuff. He's walking, he gets out of the ring and is just walking all around the ring. He gets up on the commentary table at one point, just walks across that. But he, he's pretty much saying he wants to uh, kick Rocky's ass, so the rock or whatever. And he's challenging him to come out and face him. And then so the nation ends up coming out and of course the rock's standing up there. Uh, but he's standing up there and he sends the other nation members, so Faru, Kama, and D'Lo, out to the ring. And so, and then he walks to the back, so back through the stage or whatever, so you don't see him. And so the nation starts surrounding the ring on three sides, and D'Lo ends up getting into the ring first. And so Stone Cold attacks him and hits him with a stunner real quick. And I think maybe dealing with some other nation members or just the stuff with D'Lo. While Austin is dealing with that, The Rock comes running down the ramp into the ring, grabs a hold of the Intercontinental Championship, which of course Stone Cold has at the time, gets out of the ring and runs back up the ramp and is posing at the top of the ramp with it. And, you know, saying, you know, like he got the belt and stuff and Stone Cold's down in the ring and all mad. And he ends up flipping the double birds to The Rock. And I think that's the first time it's probably, sh at least I can remember, since watching this stuff, it could have. I know he's done it before, but I don't know if on Raw or anything. But that's the first time we see um, Stone Cold do the double finger flip off or whatever and stuff. But I know he did it on the um, Canadian Stampede pay-per-view, but I don't know if it was on TV or not. And then Stone Cold then, because that the nation domination leaves, and Stone Cold goes over to commentary table and grabs uh, JR's headphones off of his head, puts them on, and he starts talking. He's saying that um, Rocky isn't safe, and Stone Cold's going to be around all night looking for him, trying, to, and he's going to get his title belt back tonight. So kind of threatening the Rock. After that, we then go to the commentary, and they're just talking about the events coming up tonight, and it shows that Butterbean is sitting at ringside once again. So we know something's going to happen with him since he's there again this week. And so we have that to look forward to. And that leads then into Mark Marrow coming out with Sable in a match against Jerry the King Lawler. And so it's kind of a weird match, but it's kind of fun. Um, so before the match even starts, Sable's standing on the outside of the ring or inside the ring. I don't remember. But she starts waving over at Butterbean because, you know, we had the whole stuff last week. Where Marrow's like, I saw you looking at Sable and all this sort of stuff. So she's waving at him. Of course, that makes Mark Marrow bad. And she starts yelling, or Mero starts yelling over at Butterbean and stuff. But then we start to get into the match and we see that Sable has her glass sunglasses off and commentary makes a mention of it. That she has a black eye and of course it can kind of be painting that Mark Mero is like an abusive husband with the way he's treating her and everything. But they say that she got kicked by a horse in the face and so that's why her eyes all bruised. So whatever the truth is, I don't know. Um, but it doesn't look very good right now. And so as the match is going on, Brian Christopher ends up coming out to support his dad. And he's on commentary, at least uh, I think JR some mentioned that he's coming out to support his dad. 
and Brian Christopher gets on commentary. But as Mero has the upper hand at one point in the match, he's on the outside and Brian Christopher gets up from commentary table and goes over and kicks Mero on the outside. So he's like, you know, trying to help his dad without the ref seeing because Jerry has the ref distract at that point. And then once he does that, uh, he starts like harassing Sable saying, you know, you want to be with the real man and can I have your number or whatever, stuff like that. And of course, this is back in the ring now and Mero notices that Brian Christopher is doing this. And so he goes out for Brian Christopher, but Jerry the King Lawler attacks him from behind and then ends up hitting him with his famous pile driver. And so, of course, he goes down to pin Mark Mero, but Sable runs in and breaks up the pin by, she takes, she's carrying around a whip at this point. So it's like, you know, a handle with like, bunch of leather pieces dangling off of it so a whip and so she takes that and wraps it around the king's neck and starts like choking him with it pulling him back and gets him off of Mero. and then Mero gets up and hits Lawler with a low blow and then hits him with a TKO and so the ref notices and everything and so Jerry the King Lawler wins by disqualification then next up we have probably the most famous thing that happens on this entire episode and that is the JR sit down interview with Vince McMahon and this is the whole why Brett why interview type thing. So it's that whole talking to Vince McMahon about the whole Montreal screw job and everything. And so of course we get the whole thing of Brett screwed Brett so that's the biggest like thing that come out of this interview. And then Vince starts going in talking about how Brett refused to do the honors with a company that made him, you know, because Brett has a long legacy and without the WWF that Bret Hart wouldn't be as big of a name as he is and be able to go to WCW and make all the money he's going to make. And so he's like, you know, you'd think he'd respect this company, but he, I guess he didn't. And he, for a man that's honored, you know, in such a tradition type of wrestling stuff, he just, you know, went away from that. And he said that both the... WWF and I think WCW or Bret Hart whatever they both work together to be able to get Brett as much money as they can so like you know they would like say certain things or something to so Brett could be like oh well they're doing offering me this and so they did so WCW would offer Brett more money back when they were doing the negotiation when Vince told him he wouldn't be able to pay Brett and then of course how when it comes to the Montreal and Survivor Series stuff how Brett didn't want to lose and um, so they had to come up with a way to get the title belt off of Brett so he wouldn't leave with it and take it back to WCW and all that sort of stuff And because Brett didn't want to do business. And then Vince also mentions how Brett Hart attacked him in the back in the locker room and, you know, blacked his eye because you can kind of see a little bit of blackness around his eye, but it's not really that noticeable to me at least, but how Brett got a shot on him and stuff. But Vince says, because JR asked him, but he says, no, I don't plan on suing him or anything like that. And then in the very end, he says, uh, Vince ends up saying that he wished Brett would have shown what a true champion's champion is after the fe defeat. So, you know, lost to Sean, hand over the title, shake his hand, you know, celebrate and all that sort of stuff and be a true champion. But instead he had, you know, ended up spitting in Vince's face, destroying all the video cameras, which uh, that's something JR brought up a lot was the destruction of the equipment and everything. So he mentioned that and that stuff but in the very end Vince ends up saying that he has no sympathy for Bret Hart and he made a selfish as in Bret made a selfish decision worrying all about himself and not the company that made him as in the WWF. Such so is a short overview of what happens in the promo. Of course Vince repeats a lot of the same stuff multiple times when JR asks him a question but that's just the basic overview of it all. And then from there we go into the match of the Los Bariquas taking on the New Age Outlaws and um, so the Outlaws end up coming out to the Los Bariquas music because two of the Bariquas out there, I forget who they are, I know one's Savio and I can't remember who the other one was but they're out there and then they're waiting for their opponents and their music starts playing again. They're looking on I'm like, what? Are we fighting the same people or whatever? But it's the New Age Outlaws coming out and they're um, dressed up in similar clothing to what the Los Bariquas wear. And so early as the match even starts, if it's really even a match or whatever, but um, the two other Los Bariquas end up running into the ring and start attacking the Outlaws along with the other two. So it's four on two attack. And they're all just beating up on him. And then the Outlaws are able to escape and leave the ring. And so the Outlaws get the win by disqualification since it was a four on two attack. Then next up there's a video package played on Ken Shamrock. And so it's just a thing about his time in the WWF shown, you know. So pretty much laying up for him to have a championship match or whatever. So building him up as, you know, he's 
this great competitor and all this sort of stuff. And that goes into our max match of a minis match. And so it's Nova, Horus, and Max Mini taking on Torito, Tarantula, and Battalion. Or some, I think is, I don't know exactly how to say it. But for this match, Sunny is the guest referee. So not just the guest announcer, she's the guest referee. And so of course with the mini matches, as they say every time, they're so fun. And like they're so entertaining and super fast paced. They're just going all over and everything and they're just so entertaining and funny but at one point the minis end up running out of the ring and behind commentary because Kane ends up coming out so the minis just you know run out of the ring and they go in over and hide behind the commentary table and of course the commentary is making comments about it uh, Jim Cornette's on commentary. He's like, get these little things away from me and stuff like that. Just making funny comments about them. But so Kane's standing in the ring looking out over towards commentary. I think trying to get after the minis and stuff. But as they're doing that, it like zooms out. And the headbangers have sn um, snuck into the ring. And they're standing behind Kane. And they have a boombox that they both have their hands on. And they go running and hit Kane in the head with it. But it doesn't do much of an effect on Kane. And so Kane's able then to attack them. And he dominates both of them and hits them both with tombstones before he leaves then that goes into hour two and it kicks off with dx coming out for a promo and so they start talking um about how ken shamrock didn't beat Shawn michaels last week because Shawn michaels wasn't even a match so it wasn't even a match and that sean ran brett out of town he beat his family and will now be his friends referencing ken shamrock and then triple h gets on the microphone and he calls out sergeant slaughter and uh, they're saying that you know dx makes the rules and calls the shots not sergeant slaughter and so triple h then makes a comment about sergeant slaughter's privates in relation to his wife and that triple h will sh i forget how he words it but some about show his pretty much show his wife a good time and so that makes Sergeant Slaughter mad. So he attacks Triple H and punches him and then starts going after Shawn Michaels. Well then Triple H is able to get back at Slaughter and hit him in the back with Rick Rude's briefcase. Which that has something to do with big with these shows which we'll mention in Nitro. And so after the briefcase attack Triple H then hits Sergeant Slaughter with a pedigree. And then they pull out toilet paper from somewhere I don't know where. But they take it and put an X over the top of Sergeant Slaughter and then they throw toilet paper out into the crowd to end the segment then from there we go into a match of scott taylor taking on eric shelley which scott taylor is scotty too hottie but i don't know who eric shelley is at all but this is another match for the light heavyweight tournament but instead of focusing much on the match jeff jarrett is on the phone and he's there talking to commentary and they mention or he's there on the phone to make a big announcement and he's the announcement is that he'll make his in-ring debut next week so we have that to look forward to i guess and so they talk for a while and then at the end it goes back you know focusing on the match and the match overall was pretty decent like a lot of the moves they were doing and stuff weren't bad and it was actually a pretty decent match for these two but scott taylor ends up winning with a ddt of some sort it was like a weird looking ddt off of the top rope and then from there we have mark marrow and sable coming out to the ring once again and when Mero gets to the ring, he forces JR to come into the ring to like interview him and stuff. And pretty much all JR is doing is holding the microphone for him. But uh, Mero's claiming that Butterbean is stalking Sable and challenges him to a fight. And Butterbean ends up coming up into the ring and then he ends up shoving Mark Mero. And that's pretty much all that happens before uh, officials and stuff get in the way and separate them and stuff. So I, you think I think lead up to a match to them, but I don't know if they ever have a match or not. Not exactly sure. And then we come back with the second part of the JR interview with Vince McMahon. I forgot they did the two parts. Um, so in this part, they're talking about JR asks, you know, would you allow Brett to return to the WWF once his contract's up and stuff? And Vince replies that he would if he apologized. And so all he would have to do is apologize and he'd be welcome back. And then he mentions that, you know, that Brett sold out and that Vince was, that he himself helped Brett sell out by, you know, pushing him towards WCW. And Vince mentions he, you know, regrets a lot of decisions, but he made the right choice by letting Brett Hart go and ended up screwing him. Him and stuff and how he had to do what he had to do to protect his company and the wrestlers and that he had everything he did he had to do for to protect the people that work for him and to end off the segment he says you know that brett ruined a 14 year relationship between the two of them because he forgot where he had come from and that in the end vince realized that brett wasn't the best there is the best there was or the best there ever will be in the end so that's how he ends that whole segment and so that's that whole montreal screw job conversation between jr and vince so again vince is telling his side of the whole story and why he had to do what he did
Then we go into the match of Vader taking on Goldust. And so as Goldust comes out, he's wearing a pajama shirt, no pants, but he has on like pantyhose type things. And then he has um, some slippers on and his arm is in a cast. So he's, you know, like really out there for a match, you could say. But Goldust is out there and he comes out with Gerald Briscoe. And um, Goldust says, you know, he has a doctor note for his injury. And so he hands it to Briscoe and Briscoe reads or says the Vader, you know, he does have a note. And so they hand it to Vader and Vader's reading it and as he's reading it, Goldust pulls a hammer out of his arm sling thing and just smacks Vader on the top of the head with it. So Vader goes down and Goldust goes running out and then once Vader like comes to or whatever, he keeps holding on to his head and writhing in pain and all sorts of stuff. And then that brings Sergeant Slaughter out. He comes out to the ring to cut a promo and he says that he's with the actions of tonight. He's going to be challenging Triple H to a boot camp match at their December pay-per-view, which I think it's maybe called D just DX or something like that, or In Your House DX something. I don't know, but so he challenges Triple H to a match. And then we get our main event for the night, which is The Rock, or Rocky Maivia, coming out with The Nation, taking on Dude Love. And so we got a cool Rock and Sock connection type thing a couple years early. But before the match even starts, Rock gets on the microphone and cuts a little promo. And he pretty much says that um, he's the best Intercontinental Championship or champion there ever was even though you know technically right now he's not the intercontinental champion and then he was it for a short while and of course as he's talking about this rocky sucks chance just start uh taking over through the arena and stuff so it's just a huge long thing which i believe of course would happen multiple times throughout the match but in the actual match you know not a whole lot of stuff goes on but dude love ends up hitting the sweet shin music and then his double arm ddt finisher and then starts to go for the pin on The Rock, but The Nation ends up running into the ring and disrupting that. And then The Rock ends up grabbing the Intercontinental Championship from commentary and gets ready to hit Dude Love that's in the ring being held by Nation so he can't go anywhere. And as he's getting ready to do it, Stone Cold runs down the ramp and chases after Rocky, who of course didn't notice or anything, but he notices and runs out of the ring. And, but The Rock escapes and then Austin starts fighting off the nation and that's how the show ends. And so that role wasn't bad overall. Of course it had the um, JR interview with Vince McMahon which is a pretty big part of this time in the um, WWF so that was a pretty big interview. Pretty much that made the whole uh, night with that interview. But the show ended up drawing a 3.5 rating. So we're up a little bit um, compared to the past couple weeks and stuff. So I guess people are here looking for stuff after the screw job and stuff. So that helps keep the ratings up a little bit. But now we will go on to Nitro. So again, this is Nitro 114 from November 17th, 1997. And this took place in Cincinnati, Ohio. And the show kicks off with a replay of last week as well. So it's similar to Raw. Uh, but it has the replay of the attack on Sting. So where Hogan and Bischoff challenge Sting to come out to the ring. And he does. And then all of the NWO attack and stuff. So it replays that. And so then it goes into the actual show. And it kicks off with the NWO coming out to the ring for the promo. And as they're walking up the aisle to the ring, Bischoff grabs a sign and it says, Vince fears Ted Turner. And so he just kind of held that up, showing it to the camera. So I thought that was kind of funny and interesting. But as they all get in the ring and stuff, uh, first off, Scott Hall gets on the microphone and he does his whole survey thing. And the NWO does win, although uh, WCW does get a lot of chance as well, but I think NWO is a little bit louder. And as they're doing all this and stuff, there's a We Want Sting chant. And then Scott Hall starts calling out Larry Zabisco, and Zabisco stands up at the commentary table yelling back at Scott Hall and stuff, but nothing ever happens beyond that. And then it's also noticed by commentary that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash both have tag titles around their waist, even though they're not the tag champions the Steiners are. So they're wondering where they got the titles and why they have and stuff because they're not the true champions and then eric bischoff introduces hulk hogan you know does a whole big thing to bring out hogan and hogan comes out and as hogan's about halfway down the ramp he starts pointing back and motions from the back and brings out someone else and it's rick rude so this is the famous episode where it has Rick Rude on both Raw and Nitro and so they bring him out to the ring and he mentions that sean never beat brett and that the NWO is everything right about wrestling. So showing why he's there. He was mad about the whole Montreal screw job with Bret Hart. And so now he's here and why he's joined the NWO because they're 
all the stuff that's good about wrestling compared to everything else. And then Hogan starts talking. He pretty much just mentions that Sting has been taken out by the stuff last week. And while that's going on, a Hogan sunk, sucks chant start breaking out. And nothing much more is said. It's just kind of a whole boring segment and stuff. And they ended up leaving. And it goes to commentary. And commentary mentions that the NWO is the strongest ever. And now WCW needs to respond and get more strength on their side. And then we got a Nitro Girls dance segment. Followed up by a Mean Gene interview with Ray Trailer. And so Ray Trailer, as Ray Trailer starts to talk. All of a sudden he gets attacked by the NWO from behind. And Hogan's one of the people out there. So he has his like weight belt thing. He takes off and they, he starts hitting Ray Trailer with it. And then they pull out the spray paint. Spray paint NWO on his back. Then that goes into our first match of the night, which is Glacier, Glacier taking on Ming. And Ming's coming out with Jimmy Hart. So at one point during the match, it's kind of early on too. Jimmy Hart jumps up on the apron because Glacier's dominating Ming at this point. Jimmy Hart gets up on the um, apron and like up on the ropes and stuff. And he's like waving to the back, like motioning for someone. And uh, Barbarian ends up coming out eventually. But in the meantime, Ming ends up getting the tongue and death grip on Glacier with the distraction by Jimmy Hart. And is has the grip on him and gets him down on the ground and pins him while holding the grip. And by this time, Barbarian, Barbarian has made it into the ring. And so they both start beating up on Glacier. And since they're doing that, Ernest Miller then comes running out to the ring to help Glacier. And he ends up kicking Jimmy Hart and Barbarian. And then Ming, as he's getting ready to hit, kick Ming, Ming gets the death grip on Ernest. And then all three, Ming, Barbarian, and Jimmy Hart then all attack Ernest Miller and start beating up on him. Then next up, we have a little video, which we have a couple of them played throughout the night. But it's a video of uh, WCW guys talking about Bret Hart. And so the first one is DDP. And he just, you know, brings up Bret Hart joining the NWO and how he can't believe it. Because, you know, it's like all these people are saying, you know, like, I can't believe Bret Hart would join the NWO with, you know, what he values and everything. So they're all, like, you know, convinced or whatever that Bret Hart is joining the NWO. And then it goes into the match of Alex Wright coming out with Deborah, And he's taking on Steve McMichaels. And so throughout the match, Alex Wright is dominating most of it until he misses a cross body off of the top rope which allows Steve McMichaels to then do a beat down on him in the corner and then the ref's trying to get Steve off because obviously they're in the corner and stuff and you can only like have people in the corner and beat on for so long and so in response Steve ends up pushing him and that makes the ref mad so he comes back at him even more and then he ends up pushing him so Steve McMichaels ends up pushing the ref harder and the ref goes flying across the ring and so when he gets back up and starts motioning for the bell and Alex Wright wins by disqualification then next up we have another Nitro Girls dance segment and I noticed with this one that I put it's the longest ever and and like it just seemed forever like they did a whole dance usually you know they do like a few uh, maybe a minute at most or a couple few seconds I don't know how to time it out but this just lasted it was like a whole big giant dance routine and it just took forever but that leads into the match of Chris Jericho taking on Rey Mysterio so in the match uh, which was kind of really impressive and cool not like impressive of a move but like cool that it happened uh Chris Jericho ends up doing a what they call a super gorilla press slam onto Ray off of the top rope so it's pretty much a gorilla press so holding the guy straight up over your head but they're on the top rope so Jericho is and so he's holding him up and then just falls off the top rope with Ray up in the air and just you know drops him down on the mat so it's pretty crazy to see but throughout the match Jericho's just dominated Ray using you know power and stuff over him but Jericho does move on him taking him down and so Jericho goes to hit the lion salt but as he does it Ray gets his knees up and so Jericho hits the knees and it switches up the match then Rey Mysterio attempts to do his hurricane Rana but Chris Jericho is able to counter it does two power bombs and he goes for a third one but as he lifts Rey Mysterio because obviously when Rey hits the hurricane Rana he just like springboards off the rope and and is like sitting on the guy's shoulders and then you know he swings them down or whatever uh to be on top of him but Chris Jericho grabs a hold of him instead and then hits him with a power bomb and he does that twice in a row and then on third time when Jericho lifts him up to slam back down Ray, you know, is able to counter and jump up off of Jericho's shoulders. And then he runs across the ring and does it hits a springboard off the rope and then hits the Hurricane Rana from that and then gets the pin on Jericho from there. Then we have another video on Bret Hart and this time it's Chris Benoit talking about Bret Hart once again. And then that goes back into the show and we're looking at commentary and Eric Bischoff ends up coming out to commentary and he's just yelling at Larry Zabisco and ends up slapping Zabisco on the back of the head. So that pisses Zabisco off and he gets up and starts 
chasing to walk after Eric Bischoff. Well, when they get towards the entrance ramp, Zabisco gets attacked from behind by the NWO, like, B team, as I call them. So none of the, the big stars are there. And so he gets attacked by that. And then um, they start holding on to Zabisco and Bischoff starts taking some cheap shots on him. And then when he's like knocked out, Bischoff puts his foot on him and starts posing over him and stuff. The next up we have a match of Viano 4 taking on DDP. And so with Viano, he comes also out with uh, Viano number 5. And so throughout the match, they must have switched or something because I noticed at one point because they have numbers on their pants. And I noticed that DDP did most of the match with Viano number 5. So I don't know if that was just a mistake in the announcing of which number it was or if they ended up switching. Because I never noticed it but I did notice the number on the pants. But at one point in the match the outside Viano keeps taking some like shots at DDP. So like some cheap shots and stuff. So like tr he trips him up at one point and then when DDP's laying next to the ropes he like punches him and stuff. And I did notice at one point I thought it was kind of interesting that Bobby Heenan makes a mentioned that he wonders why DDP is wearing jeans because this is the point in time where we start noticing DDP start wearing more jeans instead of actual like wrestling pants so I thought that was kind of interesting but DDP ends up pinning a diamond cutter on the Viano number five and then gets the pin on him and then Viano number four gets up on the top rope but DDP um, hits the ropes which causes Viano four to get racked on it and then Paige grabs a hold of him and hits a diamond cutter on him off the top rope taking him out and so that will lead into our number two and we have a match kicking off with Dean Malenko taking on Eddie Guerrero and so at one point in the match I don't understand why but Rey Mysterio came out onto the ramp and was just like shown standing there watching it and then it goes to commercial and comes back and he's not there anymore so I don't know what that whole deal was but in the match the moves they do a lot of really great moves and stuff of course with Malenko and Guerrero you would back that but overall the match is just kind of boring I was like okay is this match ever gonna end that's all I kept thinking about but um they end up doing super ba uh Dean Malenko ends up hitting a super backdrop on Eddie off the top rope so he just you know backdrops him off the top rope and uh they're both laying there and the ref does the whole 10 count thing and neither of them answer it so the match ends with a draw or whatever you want to call it so no one wins the next up there's another Bret Hart video and this time with Lex Luger again saying you know he was a friend of mine I don't see how he could join the NWO and stuff so building up that whole thing that Bret's joining the NWO we then get a Nitro Party video and this time it's from a like fraternity or something from Georgetown University and Kentucky and so it's just obviously a video of people in the house all watching Nitro and doing all sorts of party stuff and that goes into the match of Scotty Riggs taking on Saturn who when Saturn jumps over the railing to come into the ring all the flock comes with him and Billy Kidman gets in with the microphone and Kidman says I'm you know speaking for Raven and he said this is your last chance to join the flock and Riggs doesn't do it so they start the match pretty early on in the match Saturn does a suplex on Riggs so Saturn's on the outside apron Riggs is in the inside the ring and Saturn suplexes Riggs out but he like suplexes him onto the apron so it was such a weird like move so we had to pick him up and then like drop him straight down almost but when he does that Riggs' eye patch ends up coming off because obviously uh, Riggs has the eye patch on from the DDP chair attack from a couple weeks ago and then so he has a bandage on his eye and then eventually that ends up coming out and it like camera looks at his face at one point his eyes like all white so he must have a contact lens or something in but later on Riggs ends up going up to the top rope and so you think you know he's gonna jump off on Saturn but he ends up turning and jumping off onto the flock that was back in the crowd again and so he jumps off and onto them or whatever and Saturn ends up getting him back into the ring and Saturn hits a leg drop off the top rope and then puts him into the rings of Saturn to get the pin and then after Riggs gives up and the match is over the flock comes in and they all start beating up on Riggs again. Then we have another Nitro Girls segment our last one for the night and that leads into what's supposed to be a match between the Steiners scores coming out with Ted DiBiase they're the tag champs taking on Buff Bagwell and Scott Norton but as the Steiners and stuff are walking down the aisle and they're like halfway down the aisle the NWO runs out and attacks them from behind so no match actually happens and while they're laying there they're whipped and spray painted as well like they did Ray Trailer earlier in the night so NWO's doing a whipping and spray or painting spree I guess going around WCW then that leads into the match of Kurt Henning taking on Lex Luger so at one point they're fighting on the outside and Henning ends up grabbing a hold of the ref and throwing him into Lex Luger so that kind of like takes the ref out 
And so immediately after that, Henny runs over, grabs the U.S. title and runs back and hits Luger in the head with it. And then rolls him into the ring and Henny gets in, hits him with the fisherman suplex and like is sitting there holding the leg up and stuff, you know, waiting for the ref to pin it. But the ref, you know, obviously got thrown into Lex and taken out and stuff. So he gets in the ring and throws out the match. So he rings the bell and throws it out or whatever. And Lex ends up winning by disqualification. And because of that, that pisses Kurt Henning off and so Kurt Henning hits the ref and then continues to beat on Lex Luger until the Giant comes out to chase Kurt Henning off. And so the Giant just stays out there and leads into our next match which is Scott Hall coming out with Kevin Nash and there he's taking on the Giant. And so about down the ramp Scott Hall and Kevin Nash do like a two suite or something signifying that um, he's leaving and Kevin Nash goes over and joins on commentary. So the match continues on, not much goes on here except for Giant, you know, being powerful and dominating Scott Hall. But they're fighting on the outside and Scott Hall's on one side of their, so they're in the corner of the ring on the outside. Scott Hall's on one side of the ring post, the Giant's on the other side. And so Scott Hall's like standing there, he does like the whole like, ooh, like I'm scared type thing. And Giant reaches through and grabs him with the hand, so like the choke slam. But Scott Hall's able to break it and starts um, slamming it into the ring post and then slams it into the steps that are there. And so he does starts attacking the arm and hand area. To, and Kevin Nash on commentary mentions that he's doing it to take out the choke slam so he can't hit it. But a little bit soon after in the match, the Giant starts to go for the choke slam, but he's not able to lift Scott Hall up to do it. And so he just keeps trying for it, like attacking Scott Hall and then trying for the choke slam, but his hand's like not letting it. Looks like his hand was bleeding, but I couldn't tell for sure. But before he can do anything, the NWO comes running out and they all start attacking the Giant. And it's just a whole big mess there and they're beating him up well then the bunch of wcw guys start running out and they start attacking the nwo and commentary mentions this is a preview of world war three which is coming up on sunday so this coming sunday at this point in time obviously and so we got world war three which is the big three ring match where they have you know like a battle royal in each ring and it comes down to so many people and then they shrink it down into one ring so it's just a big huge cluster mess going on there but that is going to be it for nitro this week and so this nitro drew a 4.12 so it's a little less than a whole point ahead of Raw. So again, I think Raw had the upper hand with the whole, um, especially the uh, Vince interview about Bret Hart and stuff. So people are wanting to know and learn more or find out stuff, whatever, about the Montreal Screwjob. But Nitro still had the upper hand, of course, with NWO attacks and everything that are drawing people in. Uh, but I think because of the Vince interview, I would say Raw was a little bit better. Not much interesting happened on Nitro or Raw outside of the interview. So neither of them were really that good. But I think the Vince interview you save the nitro for me as well at least so raw one this week i guess i can say like i said no way to really quantify or count or give an official reason to why it would win but that's just my opinion so that's gonna be it for the monday night rewind podcast this week i hope you enjoyed don't forget you can follow us on youtube at awesome nerd show where you can catch the podcast every weekend in a video form but it's audio pretty much in a picture or you can follow us on soundcloud and itunes to get the actual podcast version you can um, subscribe to us and get the podcast automatically download through itunes or just find the video or podcast on soundcloud and listen listen to it there so i hope you do all that for me i hope you enjoyed subscribe to both areas if you can the podcast version and youtube and i hope you enjoyed and we'll see you next time Happy